Let's talk about race lighting. In the United States, there are many different people from many different cultures, genders, and races. One of the most beautiful things about our country is our diversity. However, throughout our history, people who are Black, Native American, Latinx, and other people of color have been treated as unintelligent, troublemakers, and as being of less worth. This is because of stereotypes that assume things about people of color that are not true. Stereotypes about people of color are so common that many people don't even realize that they are saying things or doing things that are hurtful. When people of color hear messages about themselves that aren't true, they can start to believe what they hear, especially when it is repeated over and over again. Race lighting is what occurs when people tell you things that make you doubt yourself, especially when these messages are informed by stereotypes and racism. You may be very smart, but if people assume that you are not because you're a person of color, you might start to think they are right, even though they are wrong. You may be very nice and kind, but if people assume that you cause problems and are bad, then you might start to think what they say is true, even though it is not true. Everyone makes mistakes, but people who experience race lighting may find that their mistakes are made into a bigger deal than others around them. There are two different types of race lighting, active and passive. Active race lighting is when someone says things to you to intentionally make you doubt yourself. What they say they know is not true, but they say it in a way that makes you think they could be right. Passive race lighting is very different. The person making you doubt yourself probably doesn't know they are doing so, but they say things to you about you that are stereotypes. Even though they don't do this on purpose, passive race lighting can still make you doubt yourself and become sad. So if you ever get to a point where you say to yourself, maybe I'm not smart enough, maybe I'm not good enough, maybe I don't belong here, maybe I'm too sensitive, just realize that it may not be you. It could be race lighting. All right, all right. Good morning to our uh, colleagues on the West Coast. Good afternoon to uh, everyone on the East Coast. Thank you all so very much for joining this session on race lighting. We are very excited to offer this live session for our new online program, uh, Race Lighting in Schools, Colleges, and Universities. Next slide, Luke. Um, and even more exciting is that this program is offered completely free to any colleague or student who wishes to participate. Thanks in part to the College Future, in all part to the College Futures Foundation, who provided grant funding for us to be able to offer, develop and offer this program. Um, there will also be an opportunity to earn a continuing education units for those who are interested. And we'll share some details about that at the end of today's session. We also want to give a shout out to our program officer at the College Futures Foundation, um, Sean Whalen, who's been incredibly supportive of the work. Uh, next slide, Luke, is where we want to um, also thank our sponsors, Diverse Issues in Higher Education, the CSU System, uh, and the Education Trust West for their collaboration and support in uh, getting the word out about this webinar and getting colleagues to, to um, register and participate. Next slide. So the new program uh, has four primary objectives. So first, um, you're going to be able to learn about race lighting. You'll be able to define it. You'll be able to distinguish active race lighting from passive race lighting, which are the two primary types of race lighting. Um, second, you'll be able to articulate the relationship between race lighting and the most common racial microaggressions that are experienced by people of color in academic contexts. Uh, third, you'll be able to describe how race lighting leads to a host of unhealthy and undesirable outcomes for people of color, notably a diminished sense of belonging and self-worth, uh, lower ac academic expectations for students, uh, excuse me, lower academic outcomes for students, lower career outcomes for educators, and uh, the acute effects of racial battle fatigue. And finally, we will offer strategies, strategies that can be enacted personally and institutionally to address and mitigate the effects of race lighting. 
So again, thank you for joining us. And I, I just realized I did not introduce myself when we began. I'm uh, Frank Harris III, have the pleasure of serving as a professor of post-secondary education and co-director of the Community College Equity Assessment Lab at San Diego State. And now I'm going to uh, turn it over to the good Dr. J. Luke Wood to get us started with some of the content. And I'll be back on in a few to talk, um, talk more about race lighting. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Harris, and uh, it's good to see uh, everyone today. I guess I don't see you, but to uh, have you join uh, virtually. So um, today we're going to kind of overview uh, the concept of race lighting. I know that some of you have familiarity with it, but there's going to be some uh, really good, uh, I think, content and opportunity for us to respond to questions and comments that you might have. So um, I would encourage you, for those of you who um, want to engage um, in terms of uh, a live chat, you can go to the YouTube link to do that. Uh, there's people who are, who are joining there to do that. You can also pose questions to us that we will respond to in the, using the Q&A function that's in here right now. Um, and I see that folks have already begun to use that. So in terms of, of race lighting, uh, it comes from the term uh, gaslight. And essentially, we believe it's what happens when gaslighting is ra racial. And to understand race lighting, you first have to understand the gaslight, right? And so gaslighting is when someone is purposely feeding another individual false information about themselves that serves to distort their realities, to make them second guess themselves, and to make them feel as if there's something wrong with them, that they're becoming delusional um, in some sort of way. Now, in the original um, play called Gaslight, where the term gaslighting comes from, it was written by Patrick Hamilton in 1938. And in the play are two main characters, Jack and Bella. And Jack is the villain in the play, and Bella is the person who's being victimized by Jack. And Jack is intent upon making Bella feel as if she is losing her mind. So he does a number of things to reinforce this. The first in their home are pictures and paintings on the wall. He takes those down, he hides them, and then he accuses Bella of stealing them. And whenever she asserts her innocence, he says to her, well, you know how you imagine things, or he uh, accuses her of lying. There are other ways in which he reinforces this same message. He goes to the um, into the kitchen where there are knives and forks and spoons, and he does the same thing, hides them and accuses Bella of stealing them. There is a, a person who works in a servant-like role in the house, um, and, uh, and Jack hits on this person and flirts with this person, and Bella brings this to his attention, how, how, how rude and insulting that his behavior is, and he, again, asserts that she is imagining things, that she is making up things, and that it must be her, it's not him. But the term gaslight actually comes from this section of the play where Jack is in this room of the house that Bella is unaware of, and he's banging around, he's looking for jewels. I won't tell you why, because that would ruin uh, the play, or if you want to watch a film adaptation like Angel Street, you'd, we'd want you to be able to do that. And so he's in this hidden part of the house, he's banging around, and Bella hears this noise, the noise of him banging around. In addition to that, in this uh, room, it is there is a gas light. And so basically when he turns on the gas light, there's other gas lights in the house and on the street. And then what happens is there's less gas to go around because now another light has been lit. And so the gas becomes more diffuse. The lights begin to dim and to flicker and Bella sees this. She sees this visible change in her environment. She hears this banging and she brings it to Jack's attention. And Jack again asserts, his innocence and blames Bella by, by saying, well, you know how you imagine things. Why are you making these things up? You're losing your mind. You're lying. And he continues to reinforce this message that there's something wrong with Bella. Now, this is what happens um, oftentimes or can happen sometimes in a relationship between two individuals where one person is intent upon feeding another person false information about themselves. But we also believe that it can happen in a racialized context. And there's been a number of different studies that have talked about this, oftentimes in the context of, of law enforcement or in policing or in laws and policies. Um, some of them are highlighted on your screen. Uh, one that I would turn your attention to is by uh, Angelique Davis and Rose Ernst called Racial Gaslighting, which really looks at how 
uh, this whole notion of uh, race-based gaslighting plays out in a case law context, and they use examples from a number of different cases, but one of them being Korematsu versus the United States, uh, which was essentially someone who was arguing against internment of Japanese during uh, the World War II, and basically saying that this is this is essentially racial profiling. And the government's response in the case was to say, no, this is not that. This is about protecting the country. And they were sending messages that were very false messages about the reason that they were doing it. And we see this happening, of course, in a case law context. Um, and as the other examples that you can see on your screen um, involving... Uh, racial profiling um, by Canadians of Afro-American uh, uh, descent and gaslighting that can take place for women of color scientists. But we also see it happening on an interpersonal level in the same ways that we see microaggressions happening on an interpersonal level. And so we offer race lighting as kind of a unique form of race-based gaslighting that looks specifically at this. And on your screen, uh, you can see a, a framework and part of the framework that we'll walk through as uh, in this uh, program that looks at what are some of the things that help lead to uh, race lighting. So it first begins with the antecedents of race lighting. What are the things within our culture and our society that lead people uh, to have certain views of others that raise other people up and see them as more moral, more intelligent and of greater worth, yet at the same time, draw others down and perceive them as less and moral, less intelligent and of lesser worth. And then that leads to different types of bias. There's explicit bias and implicit bias, explicit being overt, implicit being uh, kind of covert and beneath the surface. And then of course, all this leads to microaggressions, the ways in which these messages are then communicated to other individuals. Uh, micro assaults being the very overt and kind of good old fashioned racism. And then the more kind of subtle uh, microaggressions being those that are micro insults and micro invalidations. Now, it all begins uh, from our perspective with a concept that uh, really is white supremacy. And white supremacy refers to beliefs embodied within white culture that deem other races and people as less dignified and or less worthy. More simply, it occurs when individuals from the white community see themselves as more superior to others. And we know that white supremacy is something that is um, overt and it can also be tacit. It can be overt when you look at individuals who are part of, let's say, a white supremacist organization who, um, you know, walk around and purport themselves to be neo-Nazis, who are overtly anti-Black and who are part of organizations that may go to a college or a university and put flyers up uh, denigrating certain communities and doing recruitment. But it can also just be the values itself, which tend to see some groups, again, as having greater worth being of greater intelligent and seeing other groups as being lesser worth and less intelligent and not even necessarily consciously doing it, but unconsciously having similar beliefs that can be beneath the surface. And so oftentimes when people talk about white supremacy, there's a, a pushback against that because it's this notion of, hey, I'm thinking about someone who is walking around with a white hood on, when in reality, it, it can be much more subtle beneath the surface and it's embedded within the American cultural value system. Another element that's embedded within the American cultural value system is that of anti-Blackness. Now, anti-Blackness is a global phenomenon that we see uh, here within the United States. So no matter where you go in the world, anti-Blackness is a real thing. Uh, in the United States, we've seen it highlighted through uh, the Black Lives Ma uh, Matter movement, which has uh, given us names and elevated names such as George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, Tony McDay, to Maude Arbery, and has shown how anti-Blackness has been embedded within policing and how that has had a disproportionate impact on the Black community. As you can see here, anti-Blackness is an embodied lived experience of social suffering and resistance, and perhaps most importantly, as antagonism, in which the Black is a, is a despised thing in and of itself, in opposition to all that is pure, all that is human, all that is humane, and all that is white. We also know that this plays out within the uh, indigenous community as well, where there can be those who have certain perspectives of those who come from native communities that also uh, see them in opposition to whiteness and opposition uh, to, uh, to a quote unquote American value system that oftentimes puts down minoritized people. The core of anti-indigeneity 
is an opposition to self-determination for Native people, political and cultural autonomy, and the right to maintain, use, and protect traditional territories and resources. But from clear hate groups to fellow travelers and opportunists, there's little to no scrutiny of anti-Indigenous ideologies anywhere on the planet. All right, thank you, Luke. And uh, picking it up here, you may recall when um, from the figure on race lighting, the race lighting process that Luke shared earlier, was that racial microaggressions sat kind of at the center of that. And we know that oftentimes racial microaggressions are rooted in both explicit and explicit bias. And I think Luke did a good job of kind of unpacking, you know, some um, some very prevalent and inherent biases. But when we're talking about racial microaggressions, we're working specifically from the concept that was um, advanced by Dr. Daryl Winsu and his colleagues. Um, using Sue's definitions, racial microaggressions are brief, commonplace, daily, verbal, behavioral, environmental, uh, excuse me, behavioral or environmental indignities, whether intentional or unintentional, that communicate hostile, derogatory, and negative slights and insults towards people of color. And so there are several implications that emerge from this definition. Uh, the first and probably the most important to recognize is that when it comes to the, the lived experiences of people of color, especially within educational context, racial microaggressions are pervasive, right? They are experienced on almost a daily basis. And so the, uh, the second thing that we know from this is that regardless of how they're expressed, racial microaggressions do two things. They invalidate the experiences of and intellectual capabilities of people of color. Um, and they also help to invalidate one's experiences. And second is that we also know that racial, because racial microaggressions tend to be expressed subtly, uh, oftentimes it's difficult to, difficult to kind of know what someone really thinks or really feels and when you're on the receiving end of one, right? And so some folks would say that it's because of this, 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 this constant unpacking or you know, the pressure to sort of figure out, well, what, did, what exactly did that person say when they made that statement that racial microaggressed me, right? Uh, sometimes you can really get involved in this, uh, you know, really be bogged down cognitively trying to figure out where you stand with someone. And uh, because of that, some scholars and researchers say that racial microaggressions can be as psychologically damaging, if not more psychologically damaging than overt acts of racism, because with an overt act of racism, there's no need to second guess or ask how a person feels about the whereas with racial microaggression, especially if it's expressed subtly, there is oftentimes this need to sort of try to figure out and unpack exactly what, where someone is coming from when you're microaggressed. Uh, next slide. We also have to understand this when it comes to racial microaggressions. There's a the message that's said, but there's also the underlying message, right? And it's usually the underlying message uh, within a racial microaggression that really gets at the heart of the matter, right? And so we know that uh, with my racial microaggressions, uh, particularly for, you know, when they're experienced by people of color, there are a set of messages, underlying, negative underlying messages that are consistently communicated. So things like you're different from us, right? No one actually says, hey, Frank, you're different from us because you're an African-American man, but the messages that are embedded within a microaggression certainly communicates that, or you don't belong here. And you see uh, you know, many other messages that many of the underlying messages that are often rooted in racial microaggressions. Next slide. Researchers have also identified many different types of microaggressions, racial microaggressions, and they tend to fall in three, one of three categories. The first is uh, the ones that you see on the far left, micro insults. And micro insults offend someone on the basis of their identity or, or, or their culture. The second type, micro invalidations, tend to belittle or disregard someone's experiences. And the third category you don't see presented here are micro assaults. And we tend to not talk about micro assaults as much when we're discussing racial microaggressions because they're actually more consistent with an overt act of racism, right? Such as expressing a racial slur towards someone. And so unlike a micro insult and unlike micro invalidations, micro assaults tend to be very intentional and very transparent, right? And so there's not this self underlying, uh, you know, need to sort of figure out or unpack the message. They, they tend to be very, you know, very well understood when you experience them and when they're expressed. 
And then that brings us to race lighting, right? So again, recognizing that uh, racial microaggressions tend to be the, uh, you know, one of the triggers or one of the ways in which race lighting occurs. And of course, as Luke explained earlier, race lighting is an act of psychological manipulation where messages, uh, where people of color receive racial messages that distort their realities and lead them to second guess themselves. So um, we also know this from our work in the next slide that there are tend to be two types of race lighting. Uh, that being said, although there are two types, the end result tends to be the same. And that is the feelings of self doubt, the feelings of anxiety, insecurity and disorientation and so forth. And so um, what separates the two types of race lighting is the intention of the person who's conveying the race lighting message. So with the first type, active race lighting, for example, there is an intentional attempt to make a person of color feel as though something is wrong with them or that they did not experience racism or a racial microaggression. So for example, let's say someone accuses Luke of being overly aggressive in his communication in a meeting with colleagues. Um, we, and, and, and you know, we also know that this is a very common, harmful, and actually a very effective stereotype that plays on the notion that men of color are to be feared. So in response to this comment, Luke expresses his displeasure of being stereotyped in this way. And in response to Luke, Luke's response, the colleague says, hey, Luke, listen, I'm sorry. Now you're being way too sensitive. I'm not accusing you of anything. I'm just asking that you tone down your voice because you're scaring all of us in this meeting, right? And, and this response, of course, only uh, further exacerbates Luke's ex initial feeling of being harmed, right? So that would be an example of active race lighting where the person knew what they were saying, the person um, you know, activated a, a racial stereotype, uh, knew that that's what they were doing. And when they were called, you know, when it was brought to their attention, in many ways, they doubled down, right? All with the goal of harming Luke and making Luke feel a certain kind of way about himself. Now with passive race lighting, which is the second type, there isn't necessarily an attempt to harm or disorient someone, although that tends to be what still occurs. So let's take the same, you know, same scenario where Luke is being accused of being aggressive in his communication in the meeting with colleagues. Luke raises concern about being stereotyped in this way. And instead, the colleague says, I'm sorry, I really don't know anything about stereotypes or microaggressions. I'm just feeling a little uncomfortable and a little overwhelmed, right? And so with that situation, uh, the person is actually not necessarily trying to make Luke, trying to harm Luke or make Luke feel a certain way or even trying to activate a racist stereotype, but they are doing it. And in response to being called out about it, they tend to do what, you know, which is actually fairly common in these situations, which is to say something to defend themselves or observe themselves of accountability for the statement, oftentimes by declaring you know, a, a certain level of incompetence or a lack of, of racial uh, competence, uh, all with the goal of, of not having to be held accountable, right? Again, not, intentional, not intentionally trying to do it, but the end result is still the same, right? Luke feels harmed, Luke feels disoriented, Luke feels that space, leaves that, leaves that space feeling humiliated in front of his colleagues and so forth. And so what we also have to know is that, you know, regardless of the type of race lighting that occurs, uh, you know, these interactions leave us feeling insecure and shame. And over time, after having literally hundreds of similar interactions and experiences the, and the cumulative effects of them, uh, you know, we can begin to experience what Dr. William A. Smith describes as racial battle fatigue. Uh, and we're going to talk more about racial battle fatigue in greater de detail in next week's session. So uh, make sure you tune in for that. Um, and in the next slide here, we, we sort of unpack and, and provide a distinction between how is race lighting similar but different from gas lighting. Uh, and they're very similar except in three primary ways, right? So obviously with race lighting, race and racism is central to those interactions, right? So one can experience gas lighting without it being you know, uh, situated in a racialized context, whereas race lighting is rooted in a racialized context. The second is that with race lighting, we can experience this at both an individual level and at a group level, right? So in the, 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 um, 
the the interaction that I just described with Luke and his colleagues in the meeting would be something that's much more individual, right? That's there's an interpersonal interaction there, or interpersonal feeling. But when we think about institutional racism and the things that institutions do to uh, race like people of color, for example, that's something that we can we we can experience at a more group level, or more collective level as people of color within a particular context. Without it, the message is being necessarily targeted directly to us or without it being a result of an interpersonal interaction between me uh, or Luke and one other person or a handful of per people. And then also, uh, you know, gaslighting, it's, it's very conscious and very intentional. And as we just described, uh, we have active race lighting, which is, you know, conscious and intentional, but there's also passive race lighting, which tends to be unconscious and unintentional, but again, still has the same effect. And Luke, I think you pick it up from here and take us home. Yes, absolutely. Um, so there are a number of different types of uh, messages that can serve to race light um, people of color. And we've kind of broken down some of the common ones. This is not exhaustive by any way um, or shape of the imagination, but there are four categories that we're attentive to. One are resistive actions where people are pushing back against um, um, against certain narratives and messages in ways that try to um, race light people of color. So it can be someone denying that racism is taking place. So you're in a situation where something has occurred and you bring it to someone's attention and they deny that that is what occurred. It can lead you to say to yourself, well, maybe it was me. Maybe there was something about what I did. Another one that we see that is highlighted here is what's called reverse causality. Um, and we, the example that we oftentimes give of this is what happens with a, a, a young child in early childhood education, who, let's say you have a young black boy who's in the classroom and he's being picked on by other kids and a kid comes up to him and pushes him, but he doesn't do anything bad. He doesn't push back. He doesn't yell. He doesn't raise his voice. He does what he's always been told to do, which is go and talk to the teacher. So he goes up and he talks to the teacher and then he tells the teacher that so-and-so just pushed me. And what we oftentimes find is that the teacher's response will be to say to the student, not um, how can I help you or getting down to eye level and consoling the student, but to say to them, well, what is it that you did to cause this to occur? And that can make the student feel like it was something about them. We also see this happen with the victim blaming that oftentimes comes uh, with the Black Lives cases where there will be an assumption that the person, well, he must not have complied. Or, you know, maybe there, there were, there was a, a there was something that was in his system that, that led to this. So there's these assumptions that put the blame and onus of a locus of a problem on the very people who are being impacted by it, which can then make you have this question like, is it me? Is there something wrong with me? Am I the problem? Am I the troublemaker? And those are the messages that can come from that. Um, there's other examples that we have. One is uh, that you can see is stereotype advancement. And this is when people use intentionally stereotypes about people of color to frame them in very uh, uh, clear ways. One that you'll see there is that they're prone to criminality. So uh, let's say that you're uh, within a, uh, a classroom environment. And let's say that it's a, a, a second grade classroom and you've got some boys who are on the schoolyard and they're throwing rocks against the fence. Now they shouldn't be doing that, but you know the teacher then yells at the one darker skin uh, black boy or Latino boy or native boy who's within that group. And as an example of what not to be, how not to act and how not to learn in front of the others. Now that same child then goes back to the classroom and they're tapping their pencil. Other kids are tapping their pencil, but there's something about them that the teacher hones in on them and frames them as an example of this bad kid in the classroom. The teacher then asks the students to line up and the students get a single file line and some of them are in line, some of them are a little bit out of line, but they, again, they pick on that, that darker skin, uh, black boy, Latino boy, or native boy as an example of what not to be, how not to act and how not to learn. So they use them and perpetuate stereotypes that they are bad, physical, hyper, aggressive, defiant, deregulated. That can happen in colleges and universities. It can happen in companies too, where someone frames someone as being untrustworthy, uh, not being able to have a, a company card because we're worried that they might steal something uh, or we don't want to give them the key 
to the building because we don't want to, because we don't trust them. And so they, they frame these narratives around people in certain ways that purposely advance stereotypes that essentially communicate to them that there must be something about them that's wrong. The other one that you can see there is being emotionally unstable. And we just did a piece in psychology today that talked about this, if you want to check it out, where it's um, where when they say that you're emotionally unstable. And basically what it's getting at is that when we have individuals who are advocates for justice and equity, whether it's a school, a college, a university, a company, a nonprofit organization, government work, it is not uncommon for those individuals to be framed by uh, people within the community as being uh, emotionally unstable, as not being able to regulate themselves, as not being able to have proper decorum, but it's done in a way to purposely undermine the message that they're bringing so that they think that there's something that's wrong with them. Inauthentic allyship is another uh, category that, that we're attentive to, and this is when people frame themselves as either being individuals who are going to support someone or protect someone, but the narrative is false. Um, after the murder of George Floyd, we saw many colleges, universities, companies release statements saying we stand with the black community. We reject anti-blackness. We want to create an environment that's conducive to learning and supporting all the individuals within our organization. Yet the only thing that the institution was committed to doing to address those issues was to release a statement saying they stand with someone. There was no action that was coming. There was no new initiative that was going to take place. There was nothing that was meaningful, intentional that was going to come. They were purposely sending a false message that was inauthentic and that was performative. And that can then lead people within that organization who are, who are there, who have been under duress, who have been experiencing challenges to say to themselves like, uh, you know, what's going on? Are, are they really committed? Are they not committed? And it can serve to disorient the individuals within that organization. And then the last category that we often talk about is around misrepresenting the past. And obviously the whole uh, conversation nationally that's taken place on ethnic studies, on critical race theory, on race and education is one where there can be histories that are represented that uh, represent certain communities um, having done things that are better than what was done or that erase past injustices or that downplay the contributions of women and people of color. And those are messages that can serve to disorient people, make them feel like their, their community and their contributions haven't been what they have been. And ultimately, uh, with these uh, with these messages, it can make people's color come to a point where they say to themselves, maybe I'm not smart enough. Maybe I'm not good enough. Maybe I don't belong here. Maybe I'm being too sensitive. Maybe it's me. And it's that doubt. It's that disorientation. It's that sense that there's something wrong with you, that that is race lighting. And unfortunately, it occurs far too often within um, within any organization and it's a, we believe, a common experience that many people of color face. So one of the things that, that we wanted to make um, available to everyone here is a, a program that has been supported by the College Futures Foundation. Uh, Frank mentioned this earlier. College Futures uh, provided um, our center with some resources to make a program on race lighting available to anyone who wants to participate in it. If you're interested in the program, it is hosted at coralearning.org, and then you can click on race lighting. It's totally free of charge. You can receive two free CEUs for participation in the program. There are these live sessions that go along with the program. There are pre-recorded modules that um, are hosted on YouTube and that are accessible directly from here. There are readings that reinforce different concepts that we're trying to articulate that deal with race and race lighting. Uh, and there are other reports and short articles and things that you can consume that will help to um, create a better understanding. So our hope is this, is that for, for all the individuals who signed up to participate in this program, that not only will you do and participate in either one of the live sessions or all of the live sessions, but that you'll go to this page, corelearning.org, you'll go to um, courses, and you'll click on race lighting and you and all the individuals within your organization will see this as a wonderful and free professional learning opportunity that can be made available to you. 
I, there is, it's 20 uh, total hours of programming uh, that takes place. There's five lectures um, and they're broken up into five different modules. And at the end of it, you receive a certificate of completion and two CEUs that are accredited by the International Association of Continuing Education and Training. So if there's any questions about that, please post those in the chat window um, in, or the Q&A function or on YouTube, and we'll make sure to come back to that. In addition to that, we also have a website that we've put up uh, called racesliding.net. On this website, you have access to a number of different things. There's an overview of what race lighting is with the original brief that we released a couple years ago that, that uh, covers the main concepts of uh, race lighting, what active race lighting is, what passive race lighting is, how these things manifest in the lives and experiences of people of color. You can also click on race lighting works um, and you can read different articles that focus on race lighting, articles that we've written, articles that our colleagues have written. Um, and you can go there and see examples of how race-based gaslighting plays out in a case law context or in this more interpersonal context that we're talking about. You can click on definitions and see different definitions as it relates to race lighting that will help to increase your knowledge and understanding um, about what it is. We have different lectures that we have highlighted um, on race lighting, if you click on race lighting videos. But the last thing that I wanted to bring to your attention is the race lighting lesson plan. And so if you click on the race lighting lesson plan, it brings you to a lesson plan that was written by myself, um, Idar Essien, Frank Harris, and Tina King. And essentially it's a, an, a, a lesson plan that if you wanted to talk with, let's say that you're a, in a school and you have a bunch of, of teachers who want to learn more about race lighting, you could go through this lesson plan and use it. If you're in college, you're a pre-service, uh, you're, you're teaching pre-service uh, teachers or in-service teachers through professional development, you can use this lesson plan. This lesson plan is completely free of charge. It has a main video, which it could be race lighting, which you saw at the very beginning, which kind of articulates the kind of basic concepts. And then it's based upon the story of Jacob and Jazz. You can watch the story and it shows Jacob as a student and how he experiences race lighting um, and how Jazz, his friend, serves to help him realize that it's not him, that he's not the problem, and that the messages that he's hearing um, aren't really about him, but really about racism in his environment. There's multiple uh, different steps and different questions with question guides that you can use. And at the end, all we would like, like for folks to do is if you're going to use the lesson plan in full or in part to just register that you're doing so, but you can use it uh, completely free of charge. It is a resource just like the uh, website that I mentioned before where you can go and do the full race lighting program. So with this series, there are two main resources for you. First, again, is the race lighting uh, program that includes these live sessions where you can get two free CEUs and for anybody who wants to, they can get CEUs from that. And in addition to that is the racelighting.net website where you can click and get access to the race lighting lesson plan that can be used in any organization, a school, college, a university, a company, healthcare organization to better understand how racism and race lighting plays out in the lived experiences of black, indigenous, and people of color. So with that, I'm going to uh, stop sharing and we're gonna use the rest of our time today to respond to questions and comments that you might have. And so Frank is gonna join me and I'm gonna let him uh, actually respond to the first question. And then I'll start to collate the rest of the questions and we'll be taking them from three different areas. You can use the chat window, you can use the Q and A function. There's also questions that have already been posted on YouTube and we'll be pulling them from each different area. And Frank, the first question was, how do faculty push back on this practice in the tenure process? Yeah, great, great question. And one that, you know, Luke and I have spent a lot of time, you know, uh, strategizing and unpacking and work, working with colleagues to try to figure out. So a couple of things, um, you have to make sure to the extent possible that you always get some clarity about the, the tenure promotion process at your institution. What are they looking for, right? And being clear about how does your work align with the priorities of the institution, making sure that your work is somehow connected to institutional priorities that are articulated in a strategic plan. If your college or your department or division 
um, you know, has goals or strategic plan that you connect to those things as well. Um, you know, making sure that you you clearly describe the rigor and integrity of your work. Um, and I know some folks are probably thinking, you know, why should we have to do this? Colleagues in other areas and colleagues in other, other departments and programs don't have to go to these same links to address this. And I would say that, you know, unfortunately, in some ways, this is part of the reality, you know, being a, um, you know, faculty of color or faculty member who's doing work, you know, that has a, a focus on racial equity in the academy. And, you know, we know that the academy, you know, most colleges and universities uh, and schools for that matter, um, were not necessarily designed for the, the participation of people of color, especially as, 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 you know, serving in the role of faculty or teacher and so forth. And so this is part of what we have to do. Um, I would say that we should be as, as proactive as we can be about this. So early in the process from the, the time that you're, you're, you're interviewing, being clear about what your work focuses on and how your work is valuable and how does your work advances the work of the institution. Uh, making sure that you're clear about that throughout the, uh, the process of tenure promotion and your three-year review, making sure that you're, you're always getting good feedback, uh, making sure that you have colleagues and allies and mentors and other, and other areas throughout the institution that provide support. So, um, you know, these are, these are all things that, that you know, um, faculty of color often have to do, especially if your work is focused, you know, has some sort of racial uh, focus on racial equity. And if it does not have a focus on racial equity, we still have to do those things in many ways, understanding that, um, you know, as faculty of color, uh, our, our, our dossiers and our work is going to be um, often scrutinized more intentionally than it would be for our white colleagues. Hope that helps. Good question. Thank you, Frank. Um, another question that I think maybe we can both address, it says, We've experienced this in our department. A white person said to a black woman that she and two other black women should change their hair so folks can tell them apart. How do we get our HR and leadership to understand that this is a major issue and our department needs training? Yeah, so this is where I think the state you live in uh, kind of matters, right? So I know in, in California, for example, uh, there was some legislation that was recently passed called the Crown Act. And the Crown Act essentially uh, makes it illegal to discriminate against someone, right, on the basis of their, you know, how their hair is styled and that sort of thing, right? And so the, the response there would be to first find out, does your state, um, and does the, you know, if you're working in a public system of, of uh, higher education, does your HR policies have anything protecting uh, against this type of, you know, discrimination and, and so forth, right? Now, discrimination can be a pretty high bar, a pretty high threshold to, to, to prove, right? So oftentimes, someone can make a comment that's, that's you know, racially microaggressive, but it may not rise to the level of discrimination, right? And so that being said, I still think just being clear about what resources are available, uh, which, you know, within your state, within the system uh, of higher education, if you're working within a system or school, if school district, you know, what, what's available? What do you have? And if, you know, if you have none of, none of those resources or no policies or, or anything to protect, then I think the question, you sort of have to raise some question about, you know, what, are, what do we value as a department? You know, we, we're supposed to be a department or an institution that prides itself on, you know, uh, embracing equity and, and uh, you know, racial diversity. That might include, you know, how someone, you know, Luke likes to wear an Afro. I like to wear corn rolls, obviously. So, you know, some some folks may see these as sort of more more ethnic, you know, specific, uh, you know, ways of styling hair. But regardless, it doesn't speak to the work that we do as scholars. It doesn't speak to who we are as colleagues and, you know, our efficacy and being able to do our jobs. And so, uh, coming up with a way to strategically raise those questions and concerns, I think, are important. I know, you know, the status you have within a, a department can can sort of complicate these things. And so, if it means you may need to engage in some outreach outside, um, it really it really depends on who um, you know where you're situated, and uh, you know the context in which you're working and what policies are available to support you. Policies and resources, actually. Yeah, and the only thing I'd add to that is to remember that microaggressions is the message. Race sliding is how it makes you feel, right? right? Race sliding is just one window into the manifold ways in which it can impact you. Um, and I would say probably even 
even more important would be an understanding of racial battle fatigue, which we'll come back to at the end of this session because we have a, um, a surprise for next session. Um, next question says, ability lighting. When, are, when we are uh, led to believe that, they are, that we are worth less due to a disability, visible or not, through microaggressions, is there relevant intersectionality with race lighting? Um, so I'll say this, the, the research um, that has been done on gaslighting has focused primarily on a heterosexual relationship between a man and a woman where a man is basically uh, perpetuating these negative messages towards a person who he is with. But of course, it can happen in any relationship between uh, two individuals. There's been some work that's been done looking at how gaslighting manifests in the LGBTIQ plus community, particularly among uh, um, are among younger students who are uh, either part of that community or transgender and how they can be sent messages that, uh, that disalign with their identities. Um, I would say that we are looking at race lighting as like the unique manifestation of gaslighting in a racial context. But I would also argue that, yeah, you can go further than that. Ability lighting certainly makes sense as a, as a concept um, where you're uh, because of a, a perceived um, disability, whether as you mentioned, visible or not, that there can be um, messages that are uh, that are said to you that distort your reality. I think it can go beyond that. I think it could be uh, based upon class. I think it could be based upon gender. It can be based upon race. Obviously, it can be based upon any form of marginality. Uh, that there can be a way in which that is leveraged to essentially make people second guess themselves, make people doubt themselves, and make people feel an overwhelming sense of disorientation. Now, add to that the other part of your question about intersectionality, and I fully agree with you, yes, it can be even more intensified. And in fact, in the first brief that we did on this, we talked about this as a intersectionality as an intensifying factor, because if you have more marginalized identities, the you, the uh, the pinpoint or precision of that message in terms of how it can impact you can be even more intensified. So, for example, if it's a message, for example, about black people, it will impact me. If it's a message about black men, it might impact me even more directly because I'm a black male, right? If it's a message about a black male and add in another identity that might be marginalized, it may be even more uh, even more of an, an intensifying factor. So. Absolutely agree with that question and certainly see that as an example of a way in which uh, uh, which these issues can play out with other uh, groups. I got a lot of questions in here about uh, the links. And so we put them um, back into the chat window. There's two different main links uh, that we would encourage you to go to. One is coralearning.org. That's Cora Learning, C-O-R-A, learning.org. And if you go there, that's where you can get the access to the, the program that is two CEUs that's offered free of charge. And again, this program was supported by uh, the College Futures Foundation. So um, if you enjoy the program, you can thank them. And if you, and if you don't, you can blame us. <laughs> uh, but ultimately, uh, that's uh, one resource. The second is um, racelighting.net. That's just racelighting.net. And that's where you can get access to the race lighting website and also directly to the lesson plan. So next Luke, question, Frank. Luke, yes. actually, I, I don't know if you were intending to ask this, but it's come up a couple of times. And so this is one that I think we should address. I, I'd love to, to kind of hear your thoughts and then I'll, I'll, I'll follow you. But uh, we've got a few questions that ask, can people of color, you know, uh, race light other people of color? That's essentially what the question is. So I have a perspective on that, but I would love to hear hear what you think. Okay, let, let's see if we're aligned here. Yeah, uh, I think the answer to that is, of course, um, people of, for example, um, if we, uh, I'm going to take it out of the race lighting context and just put it in a context of anti-Blackness. Anti-Blackness lives outside the Black community, but it also lives within the Black community as well. Race lighting messages that make you second guess and doubt yourself can live outside of people of color, but people of color who are informed by a white Eurocentric paradigm uh, can also reinforce those same messages. Uh, and it can be for a whole host of reasons, but one of those reasons can be self-hatred. Um, I would go even further and say that we have seen the unfortunate manifestation of this even recently 
um, in the news media with individuals such as Kanye West um, and Candace Owens, who uh, repeatedly send out messages that can lead certain people of color to second guess their experiences, their knowledge, their capabilities, and even their basic humanity. So from my perspective, it can certainly happen from outside of communities of color, uh, and it probably doesn't make it any less impactful. And I would ar actually argue that if you're receiving this, these messages from people who aren't from your community and then it's reinforced by your own community, it can even probably further intensify the disorienting um, element of it. Frank, what do you think? Yeah, we're we're aligned there. I, you know, sometimes we can be complicit in our own oppression. And when we think about white supremacy, white supremacy, as an example, um, are, are, are a set of behaviors and beliefs, right? And, and people of color can enact those behaviors and people of color can certainly embrace the beliefs of white supremacy. And so I don't think that they're, they're specific or endemic to, to any particular person or group. Um, and so, yeah, and I, and I think the point you made, one that I hadn't thought about, I gotta give you, you uh, some credit for this, is what is the effect when you know you're sort of getting these these race lighting messages from outside of your your community and you're getting them from within? How that can kind of further exacerbate and intensify the effect? Um, I, I think that's a really that's a really spot on point there that you made. So thank you for everyone who asked posed that question. I know it came up a few times. So here's a question. Um, it says, how do you obtain buy-in from faculty? who do not feel there are any issues, who immediately respond, I don't believe we have a problem. This person says, I am in a predominantly rural Caucasian community. I often get, I just don't see that. Yeah, well, you know, um, <laughs> that that is is often a response, right? I mean, you know, the, the, the fact of the matter is this. No one, especially an educator, wants to be perceived as racist, racially microaggressive, and so on, right? Nobody wants to, to be perceived that way. And so there's often a defensiveness that comes with, you know, when, when someone brings it to someone, you know, to their attention that they're doing this, there can be a defensiveness. There can be like an example that we shared uh, about Luke's experience with passive race lighting. There can be a lot of incentive to, to, to declare incompetence in this area, right? All with the goal, we have to see it all as a way to avoid accountability. Right. That's that's really ultimately what it's about. And so I think you press for you, you, you continue to press it further. Um, you and obviously how you do it depends on your relationship with that person. It depends on where you're situated within the organization. You don't want to. We often say you don't want to do anything that's going to cause you yourself further harm and, you know, make yourself more of a target, so to speak. And so I think, you know, you, you, you address it directly if you can. If you can't, you try to identify other allies or other people who can maybe you know, support you in addressing it. Uh, above all, and this is something that Luke and I often share when we talk about race lighting, is you, you have to strategically find other spaces that are more affirming, right? So if you're in a department and you're constantly experiencing race lighting, then you have to find spaces outside of your department where you feel healthy and where you feel whole and where you feel a sense of belonging and spend as much time there as you can recognizing that, you know, sometimes you can't completely avoid the space in which you're, you're being targeted. But those are some things that we often talk about as strategies. This is a question that's coming from YouTube. It says, how do you encourage folks to use uh, the lesson plans even when the schools are majority students and folks of color? Uh, is it still needed as the structure of race lighting um, is baked in? Um, I would argue that no matter what context, whether it's a majority people of color audience, whether it's a majority white audience, that it's still useful because as the, the example we just gave, race lighting can incur out group and also be reinforced um, in group. And honestly, from my perspective, what we're trying to do is just give language that helps people to describe uh, their experiences. And that language in itself, whether you're in that environment or go on to other environments is empowering. It's the very reason why people learn about the difference between explicit bias and implicit bias, so they can name what's happening. It's right. the very same reason why people learn about the difference between a micro assault, a micro insult, and a micro invalidation, so they can say, that's what is occurring to me. It's the very reason that people learn about an assumption of criminality and how that's different than pathologizing culture and how that's different than an ascription of intelligence. 
all these are different languages and words and concepts that come from microaggressions, that come from bias. That language is important because it, it helps to take away some of the power of the unknown. And one of the reasons that uh, race lighting is so um, powerful, and one of the reasons even microaggressions themselves are so powerful, is because of a concept called attributional ambiguity. Attributional ambiguity is this sense of haziness or lack of clarity about what just happened. And then that, again, can be that doorway to race lighting, where then you start to second guess your experiences, your perceptions, your realities, and you start to think, well, maybe it's me. But that language, once you understand what is taking place and you can say, hey, that was pathologizing culture or in a race lighting context, that was active race lighting, that was passive race lighting, or that was someone who's misrepresenting the past, or that was someone who was being an inauthentic ally. Once you have that language, that language takes away some of the power from the messages. It doesn't take away all the harm, but it gives us an understanding of what's taking place, which then gives us more control about how we can address the issues that we're seeing. So Luke, we are at time, but as we're as we're wrapping up, um, there was a couple of questions about you know can are these materials really available for open access? And I, I want to reaffirm that they are indeed open access. You can use them, you can share them. Uh, there's no cost because of the support we receive from the College Futures Foundation. Uh, we ask that you not recreate them, right? That you you kind of use them in in the original form that that we're sharing them, and that you just give us give us so attribution uh, and credit for them. And then what we'll do is um, our next session, we have, there's 105 questions here that we didn't get to. And there's probably another 30 or so that are on YouTube. We'll look through the questions. We'll identify some of the common themes and we'll make sure that we have time to address those in our next session. And I'll go ahead and close out by announcing that at our next session, we will have a special guest joining us who is going to help further convey about how race lighting can serve as a doorway to something that, as I mentioned, may be an even more important thing for folks to understand. And that is a concept called racial battle fatigue. And so uh, next uh, session, the great, knowledgeable and powerful William Smith from the University of Utah uh, will be joining us and talking about racial battle fatigue so that we can see the linkage between bias, implicit or explicit, microaggressions, race lighting, and then ultimately racial battle fatigue, which is how all of this serves to impact us psychologically, cognitively, and physiologically, physically. And so join us next session and you'll get to hear from the great William Smith as well. Hey, Luke, before we sign off, uh, I just got a text from a good colleague the Cora session, the Cora website to sign up for the program requires a password. Yes, you just you can create the password pretty easily. And if there's any any issues, you can email admin at coralearning.org. And actually, maybe what we can do when we send out the recording, we can get some instructions in that in the email on how to sign up for the, the course. Yes, for sure. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you, everybody. Uh, we hope to see everybody on next week. Uh, it's going to be at the same time on next Thursday, November 10th. And thank you all for joining. And next time, bring a friend if you plan to come back.